November the 1st, 1944, 700 Polish children arrived in Wellington in a troop ship with returning New Zealand soldiers. They come to New Zealand at the invitation of the Prime Minister, the Right Honourable Peter Fraser, who meets the ship. Each pathetic little bundle holds the sole possessions of a Polish child. Many are orphans, many are motherless. Few know if their fathers are still alive. The little girls and the shaven-headed boys touch the hearts of the New Zealand people. The train takes them on the last leg of a long journey to Pahiatua camp, where they're to stay for a time. New Zealand children wave them a welcome as their train passes through the country towns. The youngsters are fascinated by the green New Zealand countryside. At Pahiatua camp, they have their first New Zealand schooling. Later, some are to go to hostels in Wellington and Hawara and others into boarding school. A board is to be set up to look after their welfare. Army staff help them to settle in. Why did these children come here? What is their story? They were the innocent victims of aggression. Their story began in September 1939, when Soviet troops invaded eastern Poland, while the Poles were already locked in a desperate struggle with the German army in the west. By the terms of the Ribbentrop-Molotov Agreement, Poland was divided and occupied by two foreign powers. The East, where the children came from, was under Russian control. I was an officer in the Polish regular army. Most of us were imprisoned in Germany. The news came to us that Soviet troops had swooped overnight on all men of authority in Eastern Poland. Some they executed, the rest they deported to concentration camps in Soviet Russia. Later, we were shocked to hear that whole families were deported. Here in New Zealand, 20 odd years later, some of the children tell their own story. They came to our home in the middle of the night. They had guns. I was very young and I remember being very frightened. They gave us an hour to pack our belongings. Then our family and the families of the other men were deported to Siberia. On the way to northern Siberia, it was bitterly cold. We traveled locked up under armed guard, herded like cattle into all sorts of vans and freight cars. We had very little food and there was no means of sanitation. As a result of that, a lot of mothers and children died from starvation, disease and exposure on the way. It is estimated that approximately 1,500,000 Poles were deported sent to the large labor camps at Siberia in the province of Taishan. The families were put into large barracks. My father was with us, but he was sick and unable to work. My mother and my sister and brother, who were 12 and 13, they work in the forest. The work was very hard, and I couldn't work. I was only 10 and had to look after baby sister, who was at the time 18 months old. We lived mostly on bread and 
water, but there was never enough. And I remember my mother slicing bread, making sure that each of us got exact share so we wouldn't fight between ourselves. I used to dream about having enough bread. I wanted. So many died from cold and malnutrition in the camp. In the summer, I used to go to school. I didn't go in the winter because I didn't have any shoes and the ground was frozen hard. The Russian villages, they were very poor themselves, but they were very sympathetic towards us. The, my parents told that they too were banished to Siberia. They used to say sadly, hey, I will grow on the palm of your hands before you leave Siberia. In June 1941, Germany attacked Russia and the whole picture dramatically changed. Russia was now aligned with the Western powers. An agreement was signed between Stalin and General Sikorsky, Prime Minister of the Polish government in exile, and the Poles suddenly found they were free. When we were told that we are free, my mother and my nine-year-old brother set for the village a day's walk away to sell some of her rings and things for the money to get us to the south of Russia, where it was warmer. They never reached the village. Nine blindness due to their to the vitamin deficiency caused them to wander off the road. We searched for a week for them. And when we found that my mother was sitting in the snow with my brother on her lap, frozen, dead, this was the greatest tragedy of our life. We buried them and soon left to the south of Russia. The Russian told us, go where you like, find your own way. The exodus started, spilling out of concentration camps and mines, forests and labor camps. They streamed in their thousands across the face of Russia, men, women and children. The men headed towards Buzuluk, where they assembled in groups eager to join the Polish army, which was quickly being formed. The families gathered mostly around Uzbekistan. Wanderers were found and brought together. Here, starvation and typhus epidemics further decimated their numbers. Help came. For some, it was too late. But with medical supplies, food and clothing from Britain and the United States, orphanages were set up and with care, many of the sick children recovered. When our father saw us safely into the orphanage, he tried to join the army. The last we heard of him was that he was rejected because of ill health. We never saw him again. Many thousands came to the end of their journey in Russian graves. Later, small Russian boats ferried the surviving children across the Caspian Sea to Persia. Thousands were permitted to stay in Persia for two years, when they had to disperse in groups to countries in both the East and the West. Persia treated them well, and in time the faces of the children were as sunny as the climate. It was from here that the children came on to New Zealand. The surviving fathers, now in uniform supplied by Britain, were fast becoming soldiers. They were to forge a link with New Zealand even before their children, when they fought with the 5th Army on the right flank of the New Zealand soldiers at Casino, scrambling across the vicious peaks behind the monastery. The New Zealanders fighting a grueling forward action through the town to link up. Each respected the other's fighting qualities. A series of battles for casinos started in January 1944, but the town and monastery were not to be captured until May. When the smoke of battle finally cleared, Polish casualties had been heavy. 
many of the children's fathers lay on the slopes of Monte Cassino. At the Yalta Conference, Eastern Poland, where the children came from, was ceded to Soviet Russia. Now they needed a home, and New Zealand adopted them. The war was soon to end. Twenty odd years have passed. How are they faring now? Anthony Sarniak is now a surveyor with the Public Works Department, engaged on a housing development scheme in the satellite city of Wellington. Stan Kunditsky is head teller in the city bank. Good day. The two Yanuskevich brothers are builders with their own business. Nine half bed, six nib. Oh, three rolls of building paper and two cases of four inch nails. Is that all, Bob? That's all, yes. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. Well Can I see you? Three other Polish children are working on the job 18, with them. 17, 7, Rudolf Schimczyka is a plumber working on a downtown construction job. Ms. Korodinska, I believe your work is in the field of education. Yes, I'm in charge of the external relations section of the Department of Education, and I'm also executive secretary of the National Commission for UNESCO. What exactly is the National Commission for UNESCO? It is the body that advises government on New Zealand's participation in the programs of the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organizations uh, at national and international level. Spisik Poplavsky is a final year medical student at the public hospital. He did all kinds of jobs to help put himself through medicine. For the Reverend Father Bengtsson, today is a doubly special occasion, a baptism and a reunion. Priest, father and godfather came to New Zealand together as small boys in 1944. The two wives are New Zealand girls. Christina Junior, Ego de Baptista, in nome de Papis, et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti, John Roy is now financial director for New Zealand for a worldwide company. I think at this time we started looking at the possibility of hooking up with uh, main branches. It may also be possible if the costs permit to hook up with London. John Roy. Hello, Bill. How about the valuation you promised me for yesterday? Oh, that's fine. That's fine. Christopher Yasinski is a registered electrician. Mr. Bialystotsky, I believe you have an important job on the Wellington Urban Motorway. What big projects have you worked on? The housing development schemes, um, hydroelectric projects in the Waikato River, um, by Piper Dam, the Marito II uh, scheme, and for a short period in Wellington on structural design of buildings. I would think this Wellington Motorway project that you're involved on now would be the most exciting of the lot. It is exciting to be the second charge of a 20 million pound engineering project. Richard's Polish wife and small son Charles are waiting. Dad promised to take Charles to see the motorway. Charles, can you see where the motorway starts right around the corner? We went fishing one time and goes along the foreshore. And then it starts where those big pillars are, where a big bridge will start rising very shortly. I've been very happy here. I love my adopted country. I married New Zealand, and this is my family. In some cases, Poe married Poe, but most of them married New Zealanders. 
These two babies are the children of Stefania Zavada. Stefania has a Bachelor of Arts degree and before her marriage worked in the Department of Education. Her husband, Joseph Zavada, another of the Polish children, works as a clerk. They're visiting her sister, Amelia Henderson, who married a New Zealander. The three older children here are hers. A state registered nurse, since her marriage, she has been both president and vice president of the Korokoro Plunkett Committee and a play center supervisor. Their brother, Leon Sande, was a deer color for four years and now is a bespoke tailor with his own business. His wife, another Stefania, is a trained secondary school teacher. Also a Bachelor of Arts, she teaches English, French and Latin at the Correspondence School. Their parents arrive with Amelia's husband. Mr. and Mrs. Sunday were not permitted to leave Russia in 1942. They were faced with a terrible decision whether to keep the children or part with them and send them out alone to a better life. The three children left, and after 17 anxious years, they finally managed to locate their parents and bring them out to New Zealand. The past is behind. Now the Sundays are happy to be just another New Zealand family. And like most of us here with young families, on a fine weekend, it's let's take the kids for a picnic. The children of the Polish children, these bright-eyed young New Zealanders, prove that the migration to this country back in 1944 has been a success. For them, and for us. <laughs>